Well, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to do two lessons today. We're going to go over lesson 11 and 12. One is the discipline of work, and the other is the discipline of perseverance. And I figure they kind of go together. I mean, if you're going to be a good worker, well, think about, let me back up. When you're in your work career, you're going to be there a long time. You know, probably I started working full time in my late teens. I uh, just retired. I retired officially at age 60, but I'm still working pretty much full time just in ministry. But for most people, they're working 45, 50 years. Um, I had an uncle that had just one job his whole life. He started in his early teens for a, um, a book distributor. They distributed medical textbooks. That's the only thing they did. And he was an errand boy. He just did errands for the company, and he retired as a vice president. Just worked his way up. And, you know, kind of rare. My dad had mainly one job. He worked for Lockheed Aircraft. Before that, he was in oil exploration. Worked all across the um, southwest uh, on oil rigs. Um, hated that, but got a dream job with Lockheed. Loved it. I mean, and I feel like, in a way, I never worked a day in my life because I really loved what I do, what I did, and really blessed in that. A lot of people don't. So I think the discipline of work and discipline of perseverance go hand in hand because this is something a lot of people struggle with. You know, how do I keep going to work every day? And the Mondays keep coming. You know, you kind of live for the weekend, but those Mondays, man, they just keep coming. For me, it's Sunday. <laughs> The Sundays keep coming. You just got to keep writing those sermons. <laughs> uh, last month, we talked about the discipline of the tongue, about mastering what we say, which is so hard to do. It's our high calling. As priests, we are spokespersons for God. And we know how deadly the tongue can be. Um, hard to develop a disciplined tongue. We talked about some keys to that. But most of all, a lot of what we really put the emphasis on is having Christ as our example. Having the tongue of Christ as our example. And what is our inward motivation? Is it for us? You know, how we speak? Are we always trying to talk about how do I make myself look good to people around me? How do I put myself in the best light so that people think, wow, he's really cool. He's really smart. He's really this or that. Or am I trying to glorify God? And that should be our prime motivation. This month we're going to talk about work and perseverance, an opening verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Taking pleasure in your toil, that is God's gift to man. Seems kind of odd, doesn't it? Work and perseverance. We spend probably, as I said, 40, 45, maybe 50 years in work, maybe more. That's about, on average, 80 to 100,000 hours of work. That's kind of mind-boggling to think how many hours you spend at work. I used to kid with my... Uh, wife and kids that you know for me a long weekend is not Saturday Sunday Monday a long weekend for me is Saturday afternoon and Sunday off because being you know you're self-employed yeah self-employed you are just you you're it you got to be there yeah I don't have to go to work tomorrow <laughs> are we doing our work well are we doing it with perseverance and are we doing it with a godly perseverance? I want to look at, if you, want to, if you have your Bibles and want to turn, turn to Genesis chapter 39. I want to look at Mo, uh, Joseph. I'm going to look at his example. We're going to look at him as the example for work. And then later we're going to look at the same passage as his example for perseverance. Genesis 39, 1 through 6. You don't have to turn. You can just listen if you want. Genesis 39. Now Joseph, now it says now when, now Joseph, remember the Joseph before had been free. He had been living with his father and his 11 brothers and his sister. 
but his brothers hated him. They hated him so much they wanted to kill him, but instead they sold him into slavery. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian. Had brought him down from the had bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had from the time that he made him overseer in his house over all that he had. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in his house and field. So he left all that he had to Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. He's probably a picky eater like me. And then in verse 20 to 23, and Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison. Remember, there was the instance in between these two passages where Potiphar's wife, Mrs. Potiphar, tried to seduce Joseph. And in his godliness, he decided, no, I'm not going to give in to this sin. And Potiphar had him put in prison. Which is interesting because Potiphar is the most powerful soldier in Egypt. He's the captain of the guard. It would have been nothing for Potiphar to have Joseph killed. Nobody would have cared. Joseph, a slave, Potiphar, most powerful person in the land next to the Pharaoh. He could have just said, you're dead. Nobody would have cared. He saw something in Joseph that made him say, I think we should just put him in prison. And as soon as his master heard the words that his wife had spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. That's verse 19. It didn't say it was anger, it was kindled against. I think it was against Mrs. Potiphar. That's pure speculation there. And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. What an example of working under severe trial. What an example of perseverance. Of perseverance. Joseph was a slave, and then he's a prisoner. And yet, he's faithful to work hard. He had no union rep. <laughs> he had no rights. I mean, think about how awful that must have been. And when he's in prison... There's nowhere lower to go. It's like, I'm not going to work here. What are they going to do? Put me in prison? I'm here. It can't get any worse. There's no incentive. Yet in both circumstances, he worked, and he worked hard, and he worked well, and he did it for an extended period of time. It's estimated there were 13 years from the time he was a freed man in Israel, sold by his brothers, to the time he was elevated to become prime minister. Are we working? Are we committed to working for a living? Or are we lazy? Or just doing what we can to get by in our jobs? Or are we working too hard? Are we having a priority on things other than God? Status, power, money, whatever motivating you. We may have to work extra hard at times if you're a single parent or your parents are sick or your kids are sick. You may have to work a lot. I mean, I think of my sister-in-law, a single mom raising two daughters. She's worked really, really hard. Tough, tough life. Yeah. Yeah. Tough, tough to do. Yeah. 
Or are we sacrificing everything just for money, power, career, sacrificing your families? And man, it really hurts. My daughter said, man, we never took a vacation. And I think, well, that's a little selective in your memory because I remember going to Williamsburg twice. I remember going to Florida a couple of times. But it wasn't like every year we're taking this humongous vacation. Sloth versus overwork. What's the balance there? We've all heard of the Protestant work ethic. I think it's mostly dead in the Western world. But I think we should think our work ethic grounded in the Word of God. And just because we're believers doesn't mean we're immune to any of this. I think that stay, I think if you look at Christians versus non-Christians in the workforce, it's probably not going to be very different, although it should be vastly different. Where does our work ethic need to start? I think it starts in Genesis 1. Who's working in Genesis 1? God is working. God is creating. God is doing it. He's giving dignity to work. He's giving worth to our work. But he's also, what's he doing on Saturdays? He's sat around Saturday. He's resting. It's the Sabbath. It's a gift that he's given to man. Ezekiel says, moreover, I give, gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And in Leviticus it says, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed feast of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feast. Six days shall work be done. But on the seventh, seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do new work in it. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. And I love how Isaiah puts it, or God puts it to Isaiah, the prophet in Isaiah 58. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honoring honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or t talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The Sabbath is supposed to be something we delight in. Take great joy. Not just a day of football especially the last year with the Patriots not doing very well. Um, or, yes, Bruce. I was going to say, but one other thing about Genesis, we all most of you out from one spot. But notice how many times he says, and he finishes each day, and it was good. It was good. He finished, finishes working on a day and says, it is, it is good. And when he finishes, it is very good takes pride in his work. Yeah. So the Sabbath is going to be, it should be a delight for us, something we enjoy doing, taking time off instead of feeling like, I got to work today. I got to catch up. When you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, who are the books about? About Jesus. And what's Jesus doing in there? He's working. This is what he came down. I came down from heaven to do this. Jesus is working throughout the Old Testament, obviously. He's doing the create works of creation, the works of providence. He's working for 12 to 15 years for Joseph before he becomes a rabbi. He wasn't just sitting around in his parents' basement waiting for the call of God to go out and start preaching. He's working next to his father in the carpentry shop. He's working as a rabbi for three years, nonstop travel. And he's not going to these conferences, at the Ritz-Carlton or some posh resort and saying, we're going to have a three-day conference on something, and then I'm going to go take a few days off and play golf. And he's working now. 
He's preparing a place for you. God created man in his image so that we can work hard as he has worked. As God first intended, and God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. But what happens? That's how we're intended to be. We're intended to work and enjoy our work. But what happens in the fall when man sins? We're corrupted. In Genesis 3 we read, And he said to Adam, God said to Adam, Because you listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you were dust. To dust you shall return. Work is hard. (laughs) I mean, that's why they call it work. I mean, it's hard. I mean, the ground doesn't naturally produce crops, bananas, fruit, wheat, whatever. It's thorns, thistles, rocks. It's a tough, tough thing. You work by the sweat of your brow. But what happens when you become a believer? Does it get instantly easier? No. No. But you are now a new creation in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And Paul says in Corinthians and then in Colossians, So whatever you eat, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And whatever you do, he says in Colossians, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. So in the garden, when we were originally made, we're there to glorify, enjoy, and fellowship with God. And in sin, that's taken away. We're driven out of the garden God's face seems to be hidden from us. But when we're renewed, we're a new creature, and we have access again to the Father. And we can work glorifying God, enjoying God, giving thanks to God. But our work ethic, let's face it, needs to be lived out in the real world. We're not living in a garden with no bosses, (laughs) no deadlines, no time clocks, no overtime. So how do we do it? First, I think we need to be energetic about our work. Proverbs 26, as the door turns upon its hinges, so does a sluggard upon his bed. We need to be busy about our work, not be lazy. We need to be wholehearted in our work. Like how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Bond servants, that is masters, or I mean uh, slaves, or not really slaves in the sense of um, we would think of it, but people that are indebted to other people, and we're kind of indebted to the bank, so we got to be working. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering good service with good will. As to the Lord, not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. We're to be working as if God were holding the time clock. God's the one counting the produce coming out of the field. God's the one on the factory floor inspecting the widgets we're making. God's looking over our shoulder. Be excellent in your work. Did God God do a shoddy or a crappy job in Genesis 1? No, and you said it, Bruce. Yeah, it's it's good enough. (laughs) I mean, it'll do. 
you know, just don't look at the backside of it. It's all right. Yeah, close enough for government work. Yeah. I have a friend that flies helicopters for the Marine Corps. And I'm I said, you realize that the helicopter you're flying was built by the lowest contractor, <laughs> the low bidder. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> be excellent in your work. Be the best you can in your skill. You may not be the greatest whatever you're doing, but be the best that you can. Michelangelo, who's one of my favorite artists of all time, in his 80s said, I'm always learning. I'm still learning how to do this stuff. I mean, this is a guy that painted the Sistine Chapel that made fantastic sculpture. I'm still learning how to do this. Be the best in integrity. Be the best in your integrity. If your boss can't trust you, be the best in attitude. You know, your morale, it can transform or it can kill your company. It's really true. I mean, I've had a, I've had a lot of people work for me over the years and you get somebody in there that hates the job, and it's like a cancer on the work floor. And be the best in dependability. Does your boss avoid you when there's a deadline or a problem to solve or conquer? Like, we're not going to go see him. You know, this is not going to get done. Some other best practices in business. I think this, this wasn't in the book. I, I just think we ought to surround ourselves with two or four or five or six men that you can call on for advice. I do this all the time in preaching. I'd call a friend of mine who's he's a lot younger than I am, but he's a lot more educated than I am, and just say, "What's what do you think of the theology of this passage? You know, what what do you think? Am I on my exegesis here? Am I on track here or not?" And he's like, "Yeah," or or you know, say, "What do you think?" Seek both biblical and secular advice. I think it's smart to have, well, one of my first bosses ever said, you need a good, every person in their life for their whole life needs a good priest, a good lawyer, and a good accountant. <laughs> and you should have them really close to the best. And you're not always going to find the best person as a believer. My best accountant, you know, Bruce, you knew him, Jim Henry. I mean, fantastic accountant. I mean, he was a little course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was a little out there. He was a former Marine, um, a little rough around the edges, but man, was he smart. And I would trust him with everything. And my lawyer, I would trust that. Um, and be accountable to others. Be accountable to others, not just your boss, but to your wife, your pastor, co-workers, friends, the study group. I know when I was in business, I joined a, um, a national group called Fellowship of Companies for Christ International, FCCI. And it was geared for owners of businesses. And we got together, a small group of us in the area once a week. And we just, you know, shared what was going on. And we held each other accountable. So, you know, hey, I'm having trouble in my shop, in my business, or how's it going with this? And just talking with each other. And being held accountable to our employers. We're there ultimately, well, from their perspective, we're there ultimately to make them money, to be profitable to them. We need to take that seriously. I mean, yeah, we want to witness to them. We want to bear the witness of Christ to them. But we're there for their profit. Remember the parable of the tenants in Matthew 25, about the the good stewards that make money for the king when he's away. And then remember in the commandment, you shall not steal. Laziness, slacking off, padding the time card, that's all stealing in God's eyes. Yeah. 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 Easy to do. It's real easy to do. It's very tempting to do. Drove 17 miles. Yeah, I drove 20 miles. Put 20 miles on your expense account. You know, just add things on there, pad it up. And along with hard work, the discipline of perseverance goes hand in hand. 
perseverance not limited to the nine to five, but to all aspects of life. Persevering in not just your work, but in your marriage, in your walk with the Lord, your relationships. The discipline of perseverance, similar to hard work, similar to that story of Joseph that I, we read earlier, taking all that time that he had and not just dwindling it away, wasting it away, not just sitting in the prison cell, not just barely getting by for Potiphar when he's working for him. And what comes to mind when you think when you hear that word perseverance? Dicking it out, toughing it out. Suffering through it. Mm -hmm. It's one of the key tenets of the faith um, that we will, by God's grace, persevere to all eternity. The perseverance of the saints. But I'm not sure that's the best way to think of it in that when we think of it that way, where do we put the emphasis? On who? Ourselves. On ourselves. I've got to stick it out. I've just got to try a little harder. I've got to do this. Let's look at this verse, James 1.12. I'm going to read it in four different versions. James 1.12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. That's the ESV, English Standard Version. King James says, Blessed is the man that endureth under temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. New American Standard, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. In the NIV, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. We'll get to that one in a minute. Yeah. That was the main verse. You're talking about Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. That was the verse that the chapter in the book really focused on. And I love that verse. I think it's one of the best verses in the Bible. But I wanted to tack from a different perspective. So I kind of left that to the very end. Trials, temptations. That's the first of the two words I want to key on. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, or King James says under temptation. The definition of that is the trial of the man's fidelity, the trial of a man's integrity, the trial of a man's virtue, his constancy. It's also, though, I like how the King James is the only one that uses the word temptation, the enticement to sin. The temptation, whether arising from the desires or from outward circumstances. There's temptations that come either from desires from within or outward circumstances. They can be out of our control, like a satanic attack. Comes out of left field. You don't know where it's coming from, but it's still a temptation to do something. Or it could be a temptation of our own making. You're a recovering alcoholic. Do you go by the bar every afternoon on your way home? Do you struggle with pornography? Are you like, I don't know, man, I think I should just open this website up, watch this movie. No, you just avoid those things like the plague. Either way, this is something that we have a responsibility to react to. The other key word is persevere or endure or remain steadfast. To abide, not to recede or flee. To persevere under misfortunes and trials. To hold fast one's faith in Christ. And again, this is something we have a responsibility in maintaining. 
And it's interesting that when you look up the Greek word persevere, it says to abide. Well, what are you abiding in? Not a hard question. What do we abide to abide in? In Christ. We abide in Christ. Jesus said in the upper room discourse, this is the like his last will and testament. This is what he's saying to his disciples just before he goes to the cross. In John 15, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Persevering <coughs> is persevering in Christ. It's not this, I got to do it, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to get it out. Persevering means abiding in Christ, resting in Christ. Another verse I want to look at, it's Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed now, so not also in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Boy, that's, I think that's one of the most discouraging verses in the Bible. Just work it out yourself. I'm going to be gone, just do it. Sounds like you got to just persevere. You got to do it yourself. It's very discouraging to me. It's got to do it. And I know what I'm like. I'm not perfect yet. I'm a sinner. So how do I work it out myself? Well, the next verse is the key, I think. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We're called to work out our salvation on the surface. Sounds like we've got to tough it out, figure it out ourselves. But when we are abiding in Christ, we realize it's actually Christ himself who's doing what? He's giving us the desire and the ability to do it. Taking the burden off of ourselves and what is he doing he's putting it back on himself think about that where's he put a burden on himself the first time on the cross he's bearing the burden of our sins think of perseverance perseverance or even the discipline of the work or the, any other sanctifying work we're called to do like this in our justification, when we're initially saved, that's 100% a work of God alone. We can do nothing to initiate it. We can do nothing to bring it out. It's what we call a monergistic work. One agent alone is working, and that agent is God. And when we think about what's coming, our ultimate glorification or Christ's return, that also is 100% a work of God. We can't do anything to initiate that or bring it about. Again, that's a monergistic work, one agent working. But our sanctification, our daily becoming more like Christ and being made holy and being conformed to his image, it's what we call a synergistic work. We are both active agents. But when you hear that, what do you automatically think when you hear that? Who, what percentages, where do the percentages go? 50-50, yeah. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> it's not 50-50. It's 100-100. God and us, we are commanded to work at our salvation. We've got to do the actual work. But it is God who gives you the desire and gives you the ability to do it. But to do so, where do we have to be? 
abiding in Christ and not in ourselves, working not in our own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you so foolish, Paul said to the Galatian church, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? Think of it not so much as perseverance of the saints, but the preservation of the saints. God is the one who's working in and preserving us to himself for all eternity. Ephesians chapter 5 and other places too talks about us being the bride of Christ. You've heard that term before, the bride of Christ. That means that, well, we're not, we're sort of married, but we're sort of like not in heaven yet, right? So we're not like consummated. This isn't totally finished. So in a sense, Christ has engaged himself to us. Is he going to break that engagement? Is he a, are you going to be a jilted Jesse at the altar? No, of course not. As Christ's bride, are we going about and doing our best to prepare for the wedding? Or are you expecting other people to do it? What are you doing to prepare for the wedding? I know before my wedding, I had to buy a suit. My wife had to get a wedding get, a dress. We didn't have wealthy parents, so we had to plan for where's the honeymoon, what's the reception going to be, what's the food, all this stuff. We had people to help us, obviously, but we had to do some of the work. And we weren't just sitting around like, we're getting married, come give it all. You know, that didn't happen. And as his bride, Christ knows the final ceremony is a way off. He's preparing a place for us. He's also given us the guarantee of his betrothal. This is going to happen. This isn't like, well, I might come back or maybe. I like how he puts in Ephesians 1. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having predestined, been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, that's in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So those of you that are married, when you, before you got married, you had your engagement period. And what did you do to start the engagement period. You gave your bride-to-be a ring. It's a pledge of your troth, as the old English would say it. You plighted your troth. You gave her a promise that you were going to follow through with this. That's what Christ has done. He's given you the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Persevering. Finishing well. In scripture, there are roughly, three, well, I wouldn't say roughly if I'm not giving you an exact number, but 347 biographical sketches in scripture. Some are just maybe a few verses long. Some are very involved, like Moses or some of the other patriarchs have lots written about them. 347, that's good and bad. Bad kings, good kings, good people, bad people. Only 59 finished strong, like really strong. People like Nehemiah or Daniel or Joseph, people like that. A lot of them finished forgiven. Like King David, he finished forgiven. He finished strong? No. His house was a mess. After Bathsheba, it was kind of like a long downhill slide. We reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. Where will you finish? Where will you finish? You will finish in heaven. 
but are you going to finish strong in the faith? That's what I love about growing old. There's a lot of downsides to it. I mean, sore knees, sore back, lack of endurance, but you can finish strong in the faith. You know, there's always forgiveness at the cross. There's always redemption, living in Christ, working hard, persevering. Are we allowing God to lead us in our work? Psalm 90, verse 17, let the favor of the Lord be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Asking God to be in our work and establish us. And are we doing all we can to persevere? Are we doing all we can to persevere? Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Our Father and our God, work into our hearts a real joy to serve you through our work. Work into our hearts the desire to serve you and the ability to serve you. Do that so that we may persevere in the faith, not in our own strength, but in Christ, knowing that you are the one preserving us, not only in this temporal, temporary, transient life on earth, but for all eternity, that we may dwell with you in the new garden, the new heaven that you are now preparing for us, for your glory. Amen.